A woman dies and like a domino reveals a long line of suspicious deaths dating back 15 years. Join me for the case of Lucrezia Borgia of New Jersey. Hey loves, this episode is probably uploading late. I'm so certain that I'm writing it into the script. That way, if it uploads early, it's a nice surprise. But hopefully, if it is late, it will only be a day late or so. I'm working hard, but I run into some hiccups while changing podcast hosts. The case we have today has some really heavy themes, so the warnings are as follows. Rape, pedophilia, fat phobia, and lots of early 1900s responses to the previous things. This is not a case where you can expect sympathetic handling of pretty much anything. In the fall of 1935, the house at 12 Bryant Place, Baldwin, New York, was bursting at the seams. Seven people from two families were stuffed into a small two-bedroom bungalow. It's safe to say that everyone's nerves were fraying. The owners and original occupants of the home were the Creightons. Father John, mother Mary Frances, daughter Ruth, and son John Jr., though everyone called him Jackie. They were transplants from New Jersey, though they had moved to Baldwin a dozen years before. The other family in the home was their friends, the Applegates. That family was slightly smaller, comprised of Father Everett, Mother Ada, and daughter Agnes. Everett was an active member of the local American Legion and had recently launched a failed attempt to become the commander of the unit. It was whispered amongst the neighborhood that it was Ada and her legendary sharp tongue that had lost him his bid. I wasn't sure where to fit this, but Applegate isn't spelled A-P-P-L-E gate. It's spelled A-P-P-E-L, gate. If you're one of those people who likes to research a case, you'll likely find many sources that have different spellings of the name. It wasn't unusual for families in the Depression to share homes. Times were tough, so they split the house up as best they could and went on with it. The two bedrooms were split among the adult couples. The dusty, unheated attic was given to the two teenage girls and little Jackie slept on the screen porch when the weather allowed, and on the floor when it didn't. Things weren't perfect in this home, and the whole neighborhood knew it. Ada Applegate gossiped about Ruth Creighton whenever she got a chance. She told the neighbors that the 15-year-old girl was no good, a flirt, and that she was trying to make moves on Ada's husband. Ruth was the kind of girl who was ahead of her time. She would wear shorts and makeup to school, things that wouldn't be a problem today, but were scandalous back then. Understandably, Ada's talk pissed off Mary Creighton. It's the 1930s, and that kind of talk will ruin a girl's reputation. That would really matter to Mary, whose defining characteristic seemed to always be described as prim. The pair would argue over Ada's rumor-mongering. That wasn't the only problem. The Creightons began receiving poison pen letters. Twenty-one poison pen letters, actually. These letters all said the same thing. That the Applegates were trouble, and that if they didn't get out of the neighborhood, something bad would happen. Mary showed these letters to her husband John, but he didn't take them seriously. He just took them to the police. But nothing happened there. So it was when September broke, there was a simmering of something just below the surface of the household. Everyone could feel the tension, though John and Jackie were possibly the only household members without an idea of what was boiling there. Ruth would later tell police that her father would get angry with her mother. He once threatened to have her head examined. No one thought it was unusual when Ada first became ill. She was sick a lot of the time. In typical 1930s fat phobia, because she was a fat woman, doctors and family dehumanized her. They considered her fatness itself an illness, 
and it showed in the way she was kept hidden away in her bedroom most of the time. This fat phobia would continue in the press and in the courtroom. It's honestly vile how she's treated. But on September 17th, she was sweating, pacing, vomiting, and having diarrhea. She was obviously quite ill. This continued for several days. Everett, her husband, finally called the doctor on the 19th, and the doctor told him to get her to a hospital. And she got there. On the 21st. Remember that detail for later. In the hospital, the doctors treated her for what they assumed was a gallbladder attack, and she improved. Mary actually visited her twice a day while she was in the hospital. Though the women had fought, they were often described as best friends. On the 25th, Ada returned home. She seemed fully recovered. That was until the morning of September 27th. Ada woke and violently threw up in the bed she shared with Everett. Her symptoms had returned, but now she was also hallucinating as she paced. Everett cleaned up the vomit and got her to return to bed, but it wasn't long before she again left it. She continued to stride back and forth, saying that she was seeing things before she collapsed. It was 6.25 a.m. when Everett called Ada's doctor, who told him to get her to the hospital immediately. So he rang up the police for an ambulance. While he waited for them to come, he called another doctor, who didn't answer his phone. After the ambulance arrived, Everett left to go track down this other doctor. I find that a little unbelievable. Help had already arrived, why on earth wouldn't he stay with his wife? Instead, he goes traipsing off just after dawn to find a doctor who's who knows how far away? Most of the time, people are so worried when an ambulance arrives that EMTs need to ask for more space. They don't fuck off to parts unknown. Everett and the second doctor returned, but they were too late. Ada was dead, but it wasn't all for naught. The doctor took one look at Ada, decided she was dead of coronary occlusion, signed a death certificate, and sent her off for burial. You're not alone if you're wondering where the other five people in the house were during this hullabaloo. None of my sources mentioned them at all. It's a tiny house. They had to know something was going on. I guess they were just hanging out. And so ended the life of Ada Applegate, gone too soon from heart disease. But one neighbor didn't think so. You see, she knew a secret about the Creightons, something from a dozen years ago and across state lines. And when she told police, she'd turned this tragedy into a homicide investigation filled with sex, lies, and bitter poison. Mary Frances Avery was born in 1899 in Rahway, New Jersey. She was often called Frances or Fanny by family and friends, but I'll be calling her Mary throughout. Not a lot of detail is available about her life. According to author Mark Gato, her parents died when she was a teen, leaving her and her younger siblings alone in the world. Luckily for Mary, it wouldn't be too long before she met and married John Crichton. Or perhaps it wasn't luck. Not that John wasn't a loving husband. By all accounts, he was a good man, if a little meek. No, the problem came from his domineering parents, specifically his mother, Anna Creighton. Mary and Anna never got along, and according to Gato, John would often side with his mother in arguments. This didn't make for a harmonious living arrangement, and things only got more hectic when Mary's younger brother, Charles Raymond, came to live with them. Some accounts say that Charles had an intellectual disability, but whatever the cause, he was often jobless, and this stirred a great resentment in Mary. Now, a lot of things in this case are often retold as fact when they sound more like gossip. At best, they're unprovable. Things like a group of neighbors getting sick after Mary made them a snack, etc. At one point in this story, people legitimately start spreading rumors that Mary was poisoning dogs. 
but there's no evidence for any of this. So keep that in mind if you read up on this case. What is evident is that Anna Creighton sickened and died on December 1st, 1920, at 47 years old. Her husband didn't think this was a natural death. Walter Creighton pointed the finger at Anna until his own death in September of 1921, also after an illness that was markedly like Anna's. Although the symptoms are listed as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and fever, which are common symptoms of a lot of illnesses. What really got the neighbors talking was when Charles Raymond passed away. He had the same symptoms as Anna and Walter. He was much younger than the other two, much younger than Mary or John, even. It seemed like the Creightons had been blighted by some unlucky star. That was until the police received a letter from an anonymous sender. The letter writer, who was either never found or publicly identified, told the police to look more closely at the death of young Charles. Intrigued, they did so. An autopsy was performed, and arsenic was found in the man's organs. According to Gato, large amounts were found, but I couldn't find a specific amount in my research. John and Mary were arrested. It was discovered that they were having money issues and that they'd received a total of around $1,800 from a life insurance policy and Charles's estate upon his death. That would be around $32,000 U.S. dollars today, so a nice chunk of change. John and Mary were having money troubles. They had baby Ruth, and Mary was pregnant with Jackie, who would later end up being born in jail while she waited for trial. Charles certainly wasn't helping with their money issues. But Charles's death wasn't the only one mentioned in the letter. It had also cast doubt upon the death of John's parents. Their bodies were exhumed, and arsenic was found in the organs of his mother, Mary's mother-in-law, Anna Creighton. It's important to note that though Walter John Creighton was examined, no one mentions it, so I assume they found nothing. Charges were brought in the death of Anna, but only against Mary this time. And this time, the motive wasn't financial, but just maliciousness. John and Mary went on trial together first for the death of Charles. Their lawyer, a former judge himself, didn't even call one witness, relying only on cross-examination and his statements to sway the jury. And it worked. The pair were found not guilty. John was free to go. To be honest, I don't believe John had anything to do with this case. He was always described as a meek, quiet, kind man. It is quite evident that he adored his wife and family, but I have no evidence to base this gut instinct on. Mary's next trial was alone. She had the same lawyer, but this time he called a few witnesses. According to Kilgallen and Gado, he called forensic pathologist Dr. Otto Gettler and according to my newspaper sources, he also called Dr. William R. Hasking. Both doctors testified that the amount of arsenic found in Anna's organs wasn't a lethal dose. If you're confused by this, you should know that arsenic is a naturally occurring substance. The U.S. is one of the countries where high levels of arsenic can naturally be found in water, and thus lower levels in foods like shellfish and seafood. Keep in mind that this case took place in New Jersey, which is close to water, so it's not unusual for seafood to be a natural part of your diet. So it wouldn't be that unusual for arsenic to be found in Anna's organs. The important part is the amount, and both doctors believed it wasn't enough to have caused her death. The jury thought this was reasonable and found Mary Crichton not guilty. She was released to rejoin her husband. But she and her husband couldn't restart their life in Newark. Rumors had grown to epic proportions while they were on trial, and the entire neighborhood believed they were guilty no matter what the verdict was. So the pair moved across state lines to Baldwin. They kept their past secret, and they built a good life for themselves amid the Depression. Until Everett Applegate came. A neighbor of the Crichtons, perhaps named Hermina Rem, 
approached the police and told them about the Crichton's pasts. Intrigued, the police had an autopsy done on the body of Ada Applegate. Again, arsenic was found in her body, but I don't know how much. Gato says there was a massive dose of arsenic found in the body. It doesn't matter, really. I just don't like vagueness. Before the autopsy had been completed, the police had begun questioning the Crichtons and remaining Applegates. In their first sessions, both Mary and Everett said nothing incriminating. Everett said that he loved his wife, and when asked what happened, he replied, God alone knows, I certainly don't. District Attorney Littleton decided to do the questioning personally, and he enlisted the aid of a consultant, a psychiatrist, Dr. Richard H. Hoffman. With the help of Hoffman, he elicited the first of many confessions out of Mary. But she didn't confess to poisoning Ada. It was a confession to poisoning her brother, Charles. Mary, Everett, and John weren't the only ones who were questioned by police. Fifteen-year-old Ruth was approached by Hoffman and told him her story after being assured he wasn't a police officer. The fact that he was working with police and would pass on her every word was presumably left out, and this was when the horrifying truth would come out. Before we get into this, I'm going to give all of you a huge trigger warning. I know that I usually leave that for the beginning of the episode, but things are about to get really bad. Discussion of pedophilia is about to follow. Ruth's statement to Hoffman is probably the most truthful in the whole case, which is heartbreaking. She told of how she met her friend Agnes's father, 32-year-old Everett Applegate, when she was just 13. Not long after this, Everett began grooming her. I was raging while researching this case. There's a kind of laissez-faire attitude toward the rape of this child. Author Mark Gato called her Mary's sexy 15-year-old daughter and said she had the body of an adult woman, which is just disgusting. And that book was written in 2008, not in the 30s. Everett Applegate loved to chase young girls. It is heavily alluded to in Dorothy Kilgaren's book that he preyed on his own daughter as well. The way the media talks about this case is deplorable. There's this fog of permissibility. You can almost read the subtext that says, well, he is a man. Which is ridiculous. Even in the 30s, people were horrified by what happened to Ruth. But the media almost seems to blame her for this whole thing, which is just fucking gross. And they keep referring to it as a relationship, which it wasn't. No matter what a grown man has manipulated a child into believing, they weren't in a relationship. He was preying on her. Everett had been raping Ruth long before he moved in with the Creightons, but it intensified afterward. Sometimes the families would have company to stay. And don't ask me why a family of seven in a two-bedroom bungalow would have guests. Anyway, when this happened, Ada suggested that the two girls sleep in the Applegates' room. Ada said that since Agnes was, in her words, stout, she would sleep on the cot, and since Ruth was smaller, she would share their bed. Everett would later admit on the stand that he'd had sex with Ruth on one of these occasions. According to him, neither Ada nor Agnes knew that this occurred in the same bedroom, while he, Ada, and Ruth were all on the same bed. Oh, and in case you were wondering, he said Ada was cool with Ruth and him sleeping naked. Twice. Ruth's account told a different, more horrifying version of this. In particular, one incident is related in Gado's book, of an evening where Everett asked her to join him in his room. They both got into the bed, where Ruth pretended to fall asleep because Ada was awake. She heard Ada tell Everett to take her clothes off. He did, and proceeded to have sex with Ruth, who was still pretending to be asleep. Ada was awake and aware of the whole thing. The next morning, the three were awake in the bedroom, and in response to Ruth's advances, Everett told his wife that Ruth was trying to rape him. Ada's sick response was to tell him to show her what rape means. And he again had sex with Ruth while his wife watched. I know I'm not supposed to say this, but fuck Ada Applegate. 
Just because she's the victim doesn't mean she's a good person. She and her ingrown pubic hair of a husband deserved each other. I hope that wherever they are, it's fucking awful. Something else they learned from Ruth was that her mother knew that Everett was having sex with her daughter. She regularly caught them having sex in the home. Not surprising since it was the size of a goddamn matchbox. Mary tried to deny knowledge, but Ruth replied with, Why, mother, you knew. You've been watching my period for four months. It was also revealed that Mary was also having an affair with Everett. Although there is some question of consent that we'll have to get into later. But for the moment, all of this information was more than enough salacious detail for the police to decide that Mary and Everett must have been involved in this poisoning. It certainly didn't help that Mary confessed to the murder the next day, and made a different confession the next, and wrote a third confession after that. I'll try to give you brief summaries of the confessions. The first confession goes something like this. Everett blamed Ada for losing the commander position of the Legion, and told Mary that he was going to get rid of her. He was also sleeping with Ruth. Mary stated that she was revolted by this, but dared not interfere. On the 25th, two days before her death, Everett brought Ada home from the hospital and came into the kitchen where Mary was cooking dinner. He handed her a packet of arsenic and told her that it was arsenic and to put it in Ada's milk. When Mary asked why, he told her to do as she was told and keep her mouth shut. The next night, Everett made Ada some eggnog and put the arsenic in it while Mary was in the room. Mary watched him feed it to her. After Ada's death, Everett told her not to worry about the questioning, that they wouldn't be able to prove who gave her the arsenic because it was a naturally occurring substance. So that's the gist of the first confession. The very next day, they got another confession out of her that was completely different. It went like this. Mary was angry that Ada was gossiping about Ruth around town. She decided to get revenge and, quote, do an injustice to Mrs. Applegate. She went to a drugstore and bought Rough on Rats, an arsenic-based rat poison, for 23 cents, or roughly $5 in today's money. She described incrementally poisoning Ada until she was sent to the hospital. While Ada was in the hospital, she didn't poison her. But when she returned to the home, Mary resumed the poisoning, eventually leading to her death. In this confession, Mary said that Everett had no knowledge of the poisoning occurring. So that's the second version. But three days after that, Mary contacted the assistant DA, who had taken her second confession, and told him she'd lied and that she wanted to tell him a third confession. His reply was to say, I was sick and tired of sitting around and listening to a lot of claptrap from her. I told her if she wanted to tell me anything, she could get a pencil and paper and write it out. Mary did so. Her third confession was a lot like the first, except in this one, she completely denied blame, saying that she had just watched Everett while Everett put poison in everything. Everett continued to deny culpability in the murder. He admitted to sexually assaulting Ruth, though of course he didn't refer to it that way. That didn't stop him from being indicted for both statutory rape and murder. He did make one admission, though. He wrote a letter to the assistant DA as well, where he claimed that Mary had offered to send Ruth or Agnes to him, sexually, while Ada was in the hospital. There's no evidence this happened, but that didn't stop the media or the DA from implying that Mary was pimping out her daughter to Everett. The motive was now, and would forever be, that Mary and Everett wanted Ada dead so he could marry 15-year-old Ruth. The story was already a scandalous news sensation, and the trial had yet to even begin. The trial had hardly begun when both defense teams received their first blow. Judge Cortland A. Johnson refused to sever the trials, meaning that both Everett and Mary would be tried together. This is never an ideal situation for the defense, because it pits the defense teams against each other. It's like having another team of prosecutors. 
not that the prosecution really needed the help against Mary. Her multiple confessions ruined her credibility. No matter what she said on the stand, no one was going to believe her. Everett's case was a bit different. There's really nothing to tie him to the crime except Mary's confessions and the fact that he's an absolute fucking monster. He had a motive, but that's not evidence. Ironically, one of the doctors who had testified in Mary's defense in her trial for the death of Anna Creighton, Dr. Otto Gettler, was testifying against her this time. He testified that he found large amounts of arsenic in Ada's organs that matched the samples of the rough-on-rats poison he'd been given, but didn't match any other food found in the house. No one could argue that Ada had been poisoned by seafood this time. Poor John Creighton was made to take the stand. He did his level best not to say anything to incriminate Mary, but he did tell the court of Everett's abusive treatment of Ada. Specifically, he told of a time Everett slapped Ada and pushed her down into a chair, which caused her to snap back. If you do that again, I'll say something that will put you in your place. John described Everett as being enraged at the time. John didn't know about Everett and Ruth, but it's unclear whether that was willful ignorance or he just didn't notice. But one time Everett said something that concerned John. John asked him, You wouldn't harm Ruthie, would you? To which Everett replied, No, I think as much of Ruthie as I do of Agnes. Which is just so awful when you know everything. During these trials, D.A. Littleton couldn't bring up Mary's previous trials for Charles and Anna's deaths because she had been acquitted and they were inadmissible. But that didn't mean that Everett's lawyer couldn't talk about them. So I bet Littleton was gleeful when attorney Charles O. Weeks questioned John about them. John was released from the witness stand, and Littleton read Everett's statement to the police and all three confessions into the record. Both defense attorneys objected but were overruled. Then the witness everyone was waiting for made it to the stand. Ruth, who is now 16, was called. She tried to cover up for her mother in her testimony and tried to say she had no idea about what Everett was doing to her, but the DA got her to admit to the truth in cross-examination. The whole thing was obviously really traumatic for her, and she was sobbing most of the time. For bonus asshole points, Mary's attorney referred to Ruth's assault as her wrongdoing as well because a teenager asked to be preyed upon by a 32-year-old man. There was really no point to Ruth's testimony. She didn't know anything about Ada's death, and though she gave one more example of Everett's abusive behavior toward Ada, no one really cared. They were really only asking her about his pedophilia, which had nothing to do with the case. I'm just saying that Everett's attorney isn't wrong when he objects and says that the line of questioning is only to blacken his client's character. On the other hand, Fuck ever Applegate. After Ruth left the stand, Mary took her place. At first, she kept to her story that she had nothing to do with the poisoning. But on cross-examination, she crumbled and admitted to putting the poison in Ada's food at Everett's urging. Mary admitted to having a sexual relationship with Everett, but on the stand, she maintained that the first time was non-consensual and that he raped her in his car. Everett's attorney asked whether she fought him, and she replied that she did. The attorney then implied that Mary, at 160 pounds, was too fat for Everett to have physically overpowered. Excuse me while I take some deep breaths. Sorry, it didn't work. 160 pounds. You realize that she's literally smaller than the average weight of an American woman today. This is extremely upsetting because fat women are told every day that their experiences with their sexual assaults aren't valid because of their bodies. But let's examine Mary's story a little closer. Because a lot of the situation makes more sense when you realize that Mary told the court that Everett was blackmailing her. He had found out about her indictments for poisoning Anna and Charles, and he said he would tell everyone if she didn't do as he said. Further, after the initial assault, 
she was scared that Everett would tell John that she'd had sex with him. So Everett may have coerced Mary into sex, which is still assault. Mary told the court she fought because it was the fucking 1930s, and she wanted to be believed. We're just now tackling the complexities of coercive rape as a culture. If we keep this in mind, more things make sense about this case. Why didn't Mary tell John about Everett and Ruth? Because she was afraid Everett would tell John about the two of them having sex. And remember those poison pen letters? They were written by Mary, who couldn't just tell John to kick the apple gates out because of blackmail, but had to try and get him to make them leave. We can't prove that this is true, but I think it shouldn't be discarded as a possibility out of hand. But regardless, Mary had dug her own grave. No one believed anything she had to say. The lawyers all made impassioned closing arguments, although none possibly more so than Everett's, who actually said that if the jury wanted to convict his client with no evidence, then they might as well lynch him from a telephone pole. Which is a hell of a thing to offer 12 white men back when the KKK was an acceptable social club. If they're bored, they might just take you up on your offer. At 9 p.m. that same evening, the jury came back. They found Mary Frances Creighton and Everett Applegate guilty. There was no mystery in the sentence for this verdict. At the time in New York, if you were convicted of murder, you would be put to death in the electric chair at Sing Sing. You might know it better as Old Sparky. Both lawyers filed for appeals, but both were denied. As the day for the execution rapidly approached, Mary began to waste away. She was bedbound and could barely eat. Prison staff thought she was faking it, and so they stuck her with pins, but she didn't react. It got to a point where she could barely speak because her throat was also affected. The governor of New York sent a panel of men to examine Mary, but they decided that she wasn't really sick, that she was hysterical. Don't know what's wrong with the woman? Must be that tricky uterus. That's where all the demons live. Mary's execution would go on as scheduled. On July 16, 1936, the pair were given their last meals and prepared for the execution. Mary fainted before hers and had to be taken to the execution chamber in a wheelchair. She never woke and was executed while she was unconscious. Everett Applegate was next. He seemed calm before his execution, and his death sentence was carried out without incident. And that was the end of them. Now, do I believe that Mary poisoned Ada? Yes, I do. I also think she poisoned her brother. I'm not sure that she poisoned her mother-in-law and father-in-law just because of the lack of evidence. Did Everett tell her to do it? I don't know. We know that he was abusive and that he wanted to marry Ruth. He even told a packed courtroom that he wanted to marry her. That gives him motive, at least. And it might not be evidence, but it took him two days to get Ada to a hospital after her doctor told him to get her there. Which is suspicious behavior. But on the less reasonable side, I don't care. I mean, really, fuck him. Everyone has those topics on which they're not able to be objective, and this is mine. I don't support the death penalty, but watch me backtrack when you bring up a pedophile. What's really interesting to me is that this is the first case I've covered where the victim was just as abhorrent as her killers. It was an interesting experience, but I did feel like I needed to shower the whole time. Let's take a moment to remember Ruth, and probably Agnes, who were the real victims in this mess. I hope they went on to have somewhat happy lives and leave this mess behind them. And I hope John and Jackie moved on too. They deserved happiness. That was the case of Mary Frances Creighton, the Lucrezia Borgia of New Jersey. With a nickname like that, I really expected that she would have poisoned more people, but she was only ever convicted of one. 
I usually don't use nicknames for killers, but I considered it was probably okay because she's so fucking bumbling. It's less supervillain and more wily coyote. You too can poison people and get caught every time and die miserably in prison. Yay! A lot of the most pertinent coverage for this case was locked up behind paywalls because those newspapers actively suck. Shout out to one of my favorite resources, the Library of Congress, for allowing me to find what coverage I could. If you want to help me research cases more thoroughly, consider donating to my Patreon. It only costs a dollar a month, and it would help me so much. I want to grow and make my podcast successful, but I'll need the help of awesome people like you. With your money, I plan to not only pay for a better mic, bypass paywalls so I can research cases more thoroughly, and increase the quality of my show. But I also want to create merch and give my patrons little gifts. But all of that will take capital. If you would like to support me, my Patreon is patreon.com slash a memory of malice. I also have a Ko-fi if you prefer giving a one-time donation. And you can find that at ko-fi.com slash a memory of malice. My Instagram is amom underscore podcast. My Facebook is a memory of malice dash a true crime podcast. And my Tumblr is a memory of malice. You can contact me or leave me case suggestions at a memory of malice at gmail.com. Really, you can leave me case suggestions anywhere email, social media, or just walk outside and yell really, really loud. I would like to send all my love to those affected by the fires on Lahaina, Hawaii. I'm going to leave some links in the details of this episode and on my social media to some vetted nonprofits that are seeking donations to help with relief efforts. Please stay safe, stay hydrated, and support each other.